Take a look at this setup. This is the ZV-E1 together with the Sony EZM B10, I think it's called. I don't know if you can see, but the lens is actually bigger than the camera itself, but you still have the same kind of capabilities as the A7S III. Yeah. This is the reason why I sold my A7S III. Talk a little bit about the sponsor of today's video, which is Motion Ray. And as you just saw in that sequence, there were some cool film burn effects and a little bit of light leaks and sort of like flames and all that stuff. And what I like about Motion Ray is that you have everything from plugins, overlays, drag and drop titles and templates that you can just implement into your videos. And on top of that, you also have high quality sound effects, music plugins for Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve, you name it. There's so many different things. Having access to that kind of library as a creator is definitely something that helps you to level up your game whenever you want to do something you know, unique for a client or put that extra edge of uh, sweetness onto your video. So if you're a creator and you want to have access to a great digital toolbox, then the link in the description is going to give you $50 off off the annual plan. Check it out. One of the reasons why I sold my A7S III is because this camera is basically an A7S III, but a new format with a new tech and all that good stuff. There are a few compromises between the two, but we're not gonna talk about the A7S III. We're gonna talk about this camera, the ZV-E1. And uh, 422, 10-bit recording, 4K 120, which is not yet released. Don't ask me why, Sony didn't release the 4K 120 upon release of this camera, because it's, it's a little bit like gaming, you know? Companies start releasing stuff that is not yet finished, only to drop a firmware update later. But I think it's cool that we're getting it, at least. And also, I'm back in the Toyota. No more TRX. It's like, it's got everything I need. But I wouldn't say no to have the TRX for a little bit longer because it was a hell of a car to drive. I love it. When it comes to the build quality of the camera, you can definitely see that it draws inspiration from both the CV lineup, but also the A7C body that they dropped, I think it was like three years ago. The biggest downside with the body is without a doubt, the grip. When it comes to using this camera as sort of like a ergonomically correct camera, this ain't it. Another thing that really bumps me out with grip is these things right? The strap holders, they're like bolted into the camera, so you can't remove them. But when you're holding the camera, they cut right into your hand. And that's a bummer. I get that Sony wants people to be able to hang this into the straps, but at least give us the option to remove these. I think that the only way to actually get rid of it is to use sort of like an angle grinder. <laughs> and when you take the lens off and put on the lens cap, you can see why they did the grip smaller than the A7S III, for example. The entire camera is sort of like rectangular. So when you want to store it down in your camera bag, it's not going to take up any more space because of the grip or the viewfinder because it doesn't have a viewfinder. As a videographer first, the viewfinder is not something that I will miss at all. I mean, like for some people, it might be great, but for what I do, I don't ever use the viewfinder. I think that on my A7S III, I've used it like two times. It feels like the material choice of the camera housing is a little bit cheaper than what you would have on something like the A7 IV or A7S III. It still feels premium. It feels lightweight and feels like it's probably gonna be a durable camera because it's sort of like this hard plastic cover. A very important thing, that I love a whole lot is the battery. Those batteries, we all know that they last for an entire day of shooting. And if you have like three of them with you in the camera bag, you're gonna be set for an all day or maybe two days of shooting. There's no mode wheel up top, which I kind of miss because I had my A7S III set up to be sort of like a run and gun shooting device. But now you have the photo, you have the video, and then you have the SNQ mode. So you still have the possibility to flick between the different important modes in a matter of seconds. We do have the classic flip out and fully articulating screen. I don't know if you remember, but Sony tried to make it popular to have the flip up screen with the hot shoe in the middle. And I was like, can't see myself. 
totally useless. This screen is the way to go. But I would have loved to see the implementation of the A7R5 screen in this as well, because it feels like that is sort of like the optimal best compromise that you can have in a camera right now. You also have the big rec button up top, which is kind of like inherited from the ZB1 series on and off switch together with a zoom lever. You also have the tally light here in the front, which is something that I love to have on a camera like this, especially since I didn't have it on the A7S III. So now it's sort of like the indicator of that the camera actually is recording. I can't tell you how many times I've been using my A7S III and then record myself only to press the record button to start the recording when I thought I already was recording. So now I don't have to have that issue. And you can also turn it on or off, which is great. When it comes to the size and weight of the camera, it is actually incredibly small. I am a huge fan of this size. It is very, very compact and it carries all the same features as the a7S III, almost. The weight of the camera is 480 grams. And if I add in one of these plates that I usually have on my camera, we're up to 509 grams. Probably gonna be a lot of people talking about the grip, saying that it's not enough, that you don't have enough switches up top or something like that. But honestly, I like it. I think the best part with a smaller sized camera is that it's gonna take up less space in my camera bag. Talking about camera bags, it's uh, almost time for what's in my camera bag 2023. There's gonna be some big changes, but that's an incoming video. Unfortunately, you don't have the possibility to shoot all intra with this camera because you don't have the CF Express card slot. And that is, in my opinion, a bummer because I would love to have this sort of like a CF Express together with the regular SD card. But now it means that you gotta have one of these V90 cards in order to be able to utilize the camera's full potential. If you've been watching my latest vlogs over on my vlog channel, I'm gonna drop the link in the description, then you have already seen some of the vlogs that has been shot with this camera. When it comes to the features of this camera, I think that that is where it shines. Being able to have sort of like a combination between the A7S III and the A7R5 in one single unit that is small and compact in the ZV series, one of the functions that I like is the auto framing function, which is basically gonna frame your face in the shot when you're moving around. So what you're seeing now is the way that the auto framing works. So the more I back up, the more the camera is going to crop in. And this is sort of like a digital crop in because we don't have the actual pixels to maintain a true 4K resolution. But I think it's great because when you're vlogging or when you're doing sort of like a talking style video, walking around like this, you can have your camera on a tripod but still get sort of like a di dynamic shot. I do wish that you had a possibility to record both the full frame and the cropped in mode because then you would be able to have two different camera angles to move around when you jump into post. But that is only possible when you have an external display connected to the camera. And then you have the dynamic active steady shot, which is almost eliminating the need for gimbal. Let me show you how good the dynamic steady shot is. Looking at the footage, you can see that the dynamic steady shot definitely crops in a lot, but it also keeps the entire frame a whole lot smoother, as long as you're just moving in a straight line. When you start panning to the side, you will get those sort of like small jittery digital bumps into your image. But I think that using this instead of having a gimbal is something that I will do because having a gimbal is just gonna take up a whole lot of space. You're also gonna be prepared that it crops in a whole lot. So you gotta have a wide lens to be able to do that. And that is where I'm using 1635 or even the 14 millimeter F1.8. Same feature as Sony ZV-1 with the product showcase button up here, which is basically removing the IAF. So whenever you're doing a video like this, you just press that button and then hold sort of like a product in front of your face and it's not gonna lock to your eyes. The new touchscreen of this camera is something that I think is a huge improvement. Not only because it's way more <laughs> responsive than anything that Sony has dropped before. And you can sort of like swipe up to get your function menu. And if you swipe in from sort of like the right hand or left hand side, you're gonna get sort of like a quick menu that you can use. And there's a couple of cool functions. You have like the digital zoom if you wanna use that. It's like times 1.5 times two times four. Now it just got spooky. And you also have the possibility to use one of the new features of the camera, which is called Cinevlog. Basically what that does is that it adds in these black bars that you can see here. And it also sets the picture profile to as Cinetone. And then you can switch between auto setting or gold or ocean or forest, depending on what kind of 
situation that you're in and what kind of cinematic look that you want to have on your video. And I think that this is great, not because I'm going to use it that much, but for someone that is new to the camera and just want to have sort of like a cinematic look to their videos, this is awesome. As a professional videographer though, I would have loved those to be sort of like markers on the actual display rather than burnt into the footage that the camera is capturing. But again, it's great for beginners because then you can start getting used to different aspect ratios. Even though you're lacking the mode wheel up top, you still have the possibility to set up custom modes. And if you're watching this video upon release, then I haven't finished up my settings for the ZVE-1 yet. But if you're watching it a couple of months down the line, well, there should be a link in the description. You also have the intelligent mode, which is basically the camera deciding everything for you so you don't have to think about anything. Okay let me show you how this works in real time. Here you can see the display of the camera. Now it's at f2.8. You can see my dad in the background. Come on! Not am I. Oh stop! See that? It adjusts the aperture and makes sure that the exposure is perfect. And then as soon as he goes away and sits down the aperture goes back to isolate on my face. Magic! I'm currently using the internal microphone of ZV-E1 and I have the microphone set to auto. What I can do is set it to front. So now what I think it might be doing is that when I turn the camera around, it's kind of gonna muffle out my voice as compared to if I were to set it to omnidirectional because then my voice would probably be louder and I can also set it to back so that when I'm behind the camera my voice is going to be crystal clear but when I'm in front of the camera it's probably going to muffle out my voice a little bit as compared to if I were to have it set to auto because then it probably detects 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 the kind of direction that my audio is coming from. I also want to do a test when we have a little bit of noise in the environment as well, especially behind the camera because there's a highway here. And now I have the camera microphone set in a front direction and no dead cat, mind you. And this is what it sounds like when I switch it to all directions. I don't know if that is that much of a difference, but it should be. And now, since I'm standing in front of the camera, when I switch to the back direction, you should be able to hear me as good as you did when I had it in the front of the Also, in the actual box of the camera, you're gonna get a dead cat for the microphone, just so you know. Since this is an internal microphone of a camera, I do think it does one hell of a good job to outperform any of the other internal microphones that you got on a professional full-frame camera. But it's also not going to be anywhere close to having sort of like a shotgun microphone attached to your camera. But in a running gun situation, this will do more than just fine. Doing sort of like a recording test here to see when the camera overheats. And as of right now, I'm recording for one hour in 4K 25 FPS. Camera doesn't feel anywhere close to be overheating. It's a little bit warm, but not something you would be burned off. But one hour and one minute without any issues so far. Now I'm gonna do a test to see how it performs when shooting F50 FPS. And this is right after I've been doing the 4K 25 FPS test. Start and uh, let it roll, see how long it can do. 24 minutes of 50 FPS recording. Oh. This camera is building on sort of like old tech right now because it's based on the A7S III, but it also has some new tech implemented into it from the A7R5. And if you wanna see my thoughts on this versus the A7S III, there's a link in the description. I do wish that Sony would have made the grip a little bit better because I think that that is my biggest complaint on the camera right now. But considering that Sony probably would want to keep this as small as possible, I'm gonna say that I'm okay with it. I'm not a fan of it, but I'm okay with it. What I absolutely love about this camera though is that it's gonna allow anyone to get into the hobby of photography and videography and the fact that you don't need to know anything about videography and photography but still be able to get some really good videos and photos coming out of this camera that is what i love because now you have the possibility to just pick this up start shooting get some really good image quality out of your videos. And then during the time as you're using this, you're gonna be able to learn everything on the go as well because it has everything that a professional camera has to offer if you want to learn a professional camera. But if you just want good videos, this is probably gonna be one of the best cameras on the market to just pick up 
and start shooting. And as I said in the beginning of this video, you know, I'm a huge fan of this camera. This will replace my A7S III as my sort of like main daily driver. But with that said, it doesn't make the A7S III a bad camera. What do you think about the CVE-1? Drop a comment down below. We'd love to hear your thoughts.